<laughs> okay. Hi everyone. Good evening. My name is Amina Yakin. I am the uh, chair of the Center for the Study of Pakistan and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's evening with um, in partnership with the Brunei Gallery and um, it's uh, it's an extraordinary pleasure actually to be doing this this event and to have the opportunity to introduce Faisal um, whose work uh, Faisal Hussein whose work I've I've come to know um, over these um, well since since the exhibition proposal came around and since then having had a chance to not see it in person but to see it virtually it's very exciting and it connects with um, my own work as well I've written a little bit about stereotyping and representation as well and um, thinking about Islamophobia and those um, conversations in a variety of contexts from uh, in culture and literature so this is um, and the other thing that I have been a part of is a the decolonizing knowledge um, festival of ideas that we had in the autumn and I think Fessel's work really speaks to a lot of the themes and uh, ideas that we were, are, remain committed to here at SOAS. So thank you very much, Fessel, for joining us today to talk about your work. And I'm going to, Fessel has given me a very humble biography. I asked him to give me a biography and he's given me only about six lines and and I think that's not enough we need more but he um he says that I create work that questions perceptions undermines lazy stereotypes and highlights missing histories and overlooked his uh, <clears throat> facts whether in music in a gallery or a sign outside a kebab shop my cross-disciplinary practice is often presented in varied environments to engage with diverse audiences, using archive and personal memory as starting points, the work explores the representation and understanding of South Asian culture and identity through the media, government, communities and individuals. So hugely important work that Vessel is doing and um, the current body of work in particular that um, you have an opportunity to view virtually on the Brunei Gallery website um, <clears throat> is has been developed in London and Birmingham as social commentary on the current climate of fear, identity and racism and the rise of Islamophobia in the UK and Europe. In previous works, Vessel has used archive and signage to create public artworks called, um, in inverted commas, F full stop light um, and the work brought aspects of South Asian heritage and archive onto the British High Street, placing them specifically at the locations of the very same family businesses and other public spaces. So what I um, have loved hearing about Fessel's work is um, the, the, the kind of mundane things he slips in while talking very excitedly about the more conceptual um, frameworks and ideas. And, and he mentioned to me that some of the artwork was transported in the food delivery van. And I really like that relationship to this real world um, that we live in and that we have to um, have to be socio-economically viable in, especially um, in the future post-pandemic world that we will come to face that poses lots of challenges and lots of hardships for people everywhere and especially uh, young people. So the other sort of um, concept um, the, the comparative work between London and Birmingham is again something that I'm uh, very excited about and looking forward to hearing more about. I think um, this is something that we are conscious of sitting here in London that we don't dominate the perspective from our from our eye view and that we are in conversation with other cities that are as much a part of Britain's um, overall kind of makeup and in what ways can we think together, you know, for our futures. And I think Vessel's work presents an opportunity to do that. Um, so the format for this evening will be that Vessel is going to take over the floor, as it were, and he's going to give you um, an insight into the title for his talk today. 
and um, he'll he'll talk for about 15 to 20 minutes, I think. Then we'll have a bit of a chat after that and we'll open it up to Q&A following on from that. So, um, Faisal, a very, very warm welcome to you. Thank you so much for being with us here today. And um, we and, and also, can I give a shout out to John uh, Hollingworth and the gallery and Lucy for their wonderful support and all the teams at SOAS who've been working behind the scenes to make this possible. So a huge thank you to them and a warm welcome to you, Faisal. Thank you, Amna. Thank you very much. And yes, just to really repeat, thank you so much to John and Lucy all at SOAS and the Brunei Gallery for the opportunity. Um, so really the, the title in terms of anti-racism in art, uh, archives and decolonial, uh, I suppose decolonial practice is quite a large one. I immediately regretted it after our conversation, but I'll try my best to uh, connect the dots um, as best as I can. So um, I'll probably just first just go through a bit of a background of myself uh, my practice, suspect objects, and then talk a little bit more about my engagement with art and academia, uh, and then also some of the actual, uh, what I deem as my decolonial practice. Um, so as I've, as you've mentioned, I'm an artist based here in Birmingham, um, and graduated from Falmouth Art College in Cornwall, uh, in, between 96 and 99. <clears throat> I believe I was the southernmost South Asian person on the British Isles for all of those years, but it gave me a very interesting insight into, I suppose, awareness of difference, otherness, uh, being away from Birmingham, running away from Birmingham to really find out more about the kind of voice that I wanted to develop and, um, and the kinds of things that I wanted to say through, through my work. Um, there wasn't many there weren't many reference points for me uh, in terms of art history and in terms of really the contemporary landscape. But Rashid Arain, um, who was the founder of the Black Arts Movement and Third Text, was a pivotal part of my education um, and also kept me grounded in some of the work that I was doing uh, and then what would be my eventual uh, graduate exhib exhibition, which um, which was basically peppered with. <clears throat> references that could bring my parents with me in a way that uh, works that had a resonance to my identity and had a resonance to why I was there and also as a bit of a payback to say look <laughs> mum and dad I have you know there are aspects of this that are applicable to us and, and who I am. Um, so finishing from there moving back to Birmingham really worked within business worked within um, a variety of all artists do a variety of different weird and wonderful jobs um, I was very lucky to have uh, a family business to work with, which involved everything from, <coughs> excuse, me, excuse me, driving, you know, kind of vans through to market trading, through to working at the uh, wholesale market. And this gave me a kind of understanding uh, on how to be able to talk to people uh, and how to be able to talk to them on a level. Um, uh, I then went on to work at the Drum Art Centre, which was pivotal in terms of really giving me understanding of black history, contemporary black history locally and nationally, uh, understanding or having a certain amount of political background of what the history of that tradition is in Birmingham, things like the Indian Workers Association, the Asian Youth Movements, and other um, uh, kind of cross-cultural uh, cultural movements and organizations. Um, and this was on the basically around the time that 9-11 occurred. And 9-11 really compacted uh, a lot of the things that I was learning to do with the history of uh, black struggle within, within uh, the UK and eventually it became a very real uh, horrific film in some ways where anti-Muslim hatred, the, the kind of hatred even that we see now uh, began, began occurring. Um, so really, my engagement then back into practice occurred at that point. Me wanting to create work that uh, I suppose responded to what things were going on. And one of the things that allowed me to do that was studying the history of music in Birmingham. I created a, a history of hip hop and also a banger in Birmingham. And it allowed me to be able to research things from a non uh, Eurocentric kind of way. And 
that was really, I suppose, the first instance where I started thinking that I should return to my own practice. Um, and in returning to my own practice, I was lucky enough to be able to visit East London um, and work at Rich Mix and access the Innova Library. Um, in fact, a, I think it was a gentleman called Nicholas Brown, who was the librarian there, allowed me to be able to access that. Innova allowed me to access those materials. And Suspect Objects, really, the, the this work came about actually through a project around gentrification of Brick Lane. The project was initially going and speaking to shop owners about you've got a shop next to you with, you know, seven pound cereal being sold. And also because of the fact that I used to pick up leather jackets from Brick Lane, I had an affinity to some of the shop owners. And actually they said, well, Fassel, you know, the things that are beginning to affect us is racism. We're beginning to see this increase and there is something really untoward about that. And as I collected more information and oral histories from them, I also was feeling the effect of certain parts of that myself, the Islamophobia within media, the pervasive way the government were, were kind of being able to, or beginning to kind of um, victimize communities. So suspect objects really came about through that research work. Um, and I'm just gonna quickly share my screen and highlight really now, I suppose some of the pieces that everyone can kind of uh, go and see um now because the, the exhibition's online at suspectobjects.com but i'll just share a couple of the works and just give a quick um description of um those that i think are are pertinent um so i think that is being shared can everyone see it um this is project champion which is one of the works in the suspect objects exhibition. Um, in 2008, more than 200 so-called spy cameras were installed in the largely Muslim areas of Birmingham, but that covered Washwood Heath, Sparkbrook, Mosley and Kings Heath. And around that time, I was working within Spark Hill, um, where I live in Kings Heath. So these were really on my doorstep. Um, and they were basically given about three million pounds of government funds to which were earmarked for tackling terrorism um, and due to a campaign that was mounted by local local people including i think it was actually mounted by a gentleman called um steve jolly um who dubbed the spy cameras as covert and that they were an invasion of people's privacy they they were eventually taken down in 2011 at a cost of, I think, another half a million pounds. So almost three and a half million pounds was spent on this, this, this um, surveillance network that was the beginning or partly the beginning of what was then to become the PREVENT program. And for those who don't know what PREVENT is, PREVENT is a, a multi-agency program looking to stop individuals from becoming terrorists essentially, or, or, um, or, or radicalized, but it's been described as other things, such as toxic, racist, Islamophobic, um, and creating a kind of us and them. Um, and I don't want to get too much into prevent, but I will, I will, I'll kind of talk about it uh, later. Um, but anyway, the campaign um, was allowed to run and these cameras were then taken down and then sold, I believe, at, at the Ramada Hotel somewhere in Sutton Coalfield for literally pennies. Um, another work in Suspect Objects that looks at this kind of subject matter is uh, Ahmed's Clock. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, Ahmed's Clock, um, or Ahmed Muhammad, um, was actually a 14 year old uh, child in Texas who deconstructed a clock. Uh, and presented it as a, as, a, as a project to his teacher who then um, basically called the police thinking that it was a bomb that had, been, that had been delivered. So he was then handcuffed and taken to the police station, I believe I, for, for a number of hours and uh, um, was, was terrified obviously as a 14 year old. And it was, this piece of work was looking at the, the fact that even very mundane uh, things, as you mentioned, Amna, can, can become almost loaded 
Um, and I wanted to visualize those kinds of suspicions by looking at the more mundane and really stupid um, ways that objects could uh, be interpreted in the context of uh, Islamophobia and racism. Um, the third and final one, which uh, example is Gove's horse, which I, I suppose a number of people will be familiar with. The Trojan horse scandal based again in Birmingham um, in 2014, a letter appeared appearing to refer to this, this kind of operation, Trojan horse operation by a plot uh, by a number of Muslim groups to install governors at schools. Um, it claimed to be ousting head teachers. And there were a number of inquiries that were launched, um, uh, namely one of the most important was the Clark Report headed by, uh, I can't remember the gentleman, well, Clark, but I can't remember his first name, but Michael Gove was a, uh, a real um, linchpin of, of this process and this this horse, Gove's horse, attributed to him is, I suppose, a metaphor around why almost two, three hundred people's pupils lost their education, numerous teachers lost their jobs, um, people were toyed with, people were manipulated and uh, this is a kind of, um, I suppose, uh, an indication of, of what that is. Um, so, in terms of this work, and in terms of the complexities of a lot of the work that I found, I, I'm not an academic, um, but being able to access the research has been pivotal in moving the work on, and through ed educating myself, but also through making the work a, a little bit more complex um, because of the fact that it raises certain issues. And one of the one of the ways kind of that I've been able to engage with academia, luckily was by being approached by Lung Theatre uh, and Professor John Homewood, um, who actually was an expert witness for the defence in cases that were brought uh, by the National College of Teaching and uh, Leadership, I think it was. Um, and he, he collected, um, I believe, or I think the play that, that this is, uh, that the Trojan Horse, this is a Trojan Horse play. Um, my, my work toured with it. Um, um, and it was written by Helen Monks and Matt Woodhead. It was based on, uh, it was a verbatim theatre piece based on 200 hours of interviews with about 90 witnesses. Um, and I saw really parallels between the work that I was doing and what, what these guys were doing in the way that really there was a need to be able to approach and get witness, get, get kind of real reactions from communities um, rather than theatre, museums and art galleries living in the hills like a giant. These, these things were part of a process that I really rated and loved. Um, so the Trojan Horse actually played toured um, uh, for a number of years, I think for two years, and uh, one of my pieces toured with it. Uh, and this was a great way of for me, it was an education being able to understand different processes and what other people were doing. Um, a second example of really where I'm trying to engage with academia, um, it's a project I'm currently working on with the University of Birmingham and Eastside Projects. Um, and that is based um, as kind of, Birmingham is a case study for broader developments and issues in urban planning, counter-terrorism and security and how, how that plays out in the public space. Um, so it's actually a group exhibition with four other artists and informed with four or five other um, academics working in specific uh, fields from uh, urban planning, sociology, uh, um, work around urban terrorism, counter-terrorism. Um, and really trying to engage with their research, using their research and trying to inform the art pieces. Uh, but this is, I'm not gonna talk too much about this because I may get into trouble, uh, but there is, this will be forthcoming in the next month uh, and something that I'll be looking forward to. Um, uh, so yes, so really the final part of um, what I'd like to mention is work around decolonialization and what I, see as my decolonial practice. Um, so I'm just gonna harp back a little bit to when I was speaking about finding information from, um, I suppose the local 
community and local engaging the local community in terms of what their experiences and what their histories were. Um, so I lost my grandfather uh, a few years back in, uh, in approximately 2010, I think it was. And due to that loss, there was um, an inherent need to be able to find out uh, stories to do with uh, the intergenerational kinds of relationships between South Asian fathers, grandfathers and sons. I wanted to explore and find the parallels between um, really my life and other people's. Um, so I see decolonial practice as a collection of knowledge from our elders, the people that we live with now, um, before they are gone and creating, I suppose, work of their experiences and ours simultaneously. Um, and there is a need for it specifically now within the current context because, and there's a lot of, because of the fact of really what we've seen in the last few years, uh, there is a lot of work that needs to be done in quite a dynamic, uh, resourceful uh, way. So I'm, uh, this project I'm particularly proud of because we were able to collect actually information from a number of individuals here that unfortunately some of whom aren't with us anymore. Um, and that's why this practice has now become pivotal to what I see as my decolonial practice. It's actually what some people may call cultural engagement. I don't really see it as that. I see archive as a form of resistance, a grassroots. It's been called all sorts of things, grassroots archivism, activism, etc. cetera. Um, but it's a great way of being able to counter the narrative of racist ideologies, especially when it comes to say things like uh, the armed forces, uh, things like Muslim soldiers uh, are, are very interesting in that, in that realm. Um, but going back to really the project, um, there are a number of different individuals that were interviewed in this project. Um, and out of this uh, flight came about, which is what I think Amna, you mentioned earlier on, where mm -hmm. the archive was taken out of the museum, out of the project onto the street. Um, this is a photo of Dr. Mahmoud Ashmi, who was, uh, the person who released the first Urdu newspaper based at Saltly, Saltly News. Um, and I wanted to champion uh, him, but also other individuals who uh, are unsung heroes in a way, um, but using the aesthetics of trading, you know, which is what um, a lot of Asian people are, are often known for. And these were placed outside of people's businesses, but also just outside, you know, kind of on the high street. Um, I've constantly said that really racism, um, racism within uh, kind of arts and so on and so forth, racism for me is a material that can be used and manipulated in different ways. It can be turned inside out. Um, we can analyze how it shape shifts, how it works in institutions until it becomes nonsense. And we can create work out of that. But in the same way, we can also, um, I suppose, look at, um, making our experiences also much more of a, I suppose, revolutionary endeavor by, by really uh, excavating um, the kinds of things that hopefully I'm, I'm kind of showing here. Um, uh, the final project actually that um, I worked on, the last project, should I say, I worked on was the history of Asian youth culture. Um, and again, this was really looking at a, a much more wholesome, uh, a whole, a whole, uh, uh, a myriad a variety of different things from political outlooks, political movements, through to cultural associations, um, and to create much more of an anthology of, of, uh, of um, different eras from the 50s through to the present day. Um, so yes, I think without really to conclude, I think reframing these kinds of narratives uh, and being able to um, respond to the way people are presented is really important for, for my kind of work and for the work that I want to create. Um, I think reforming, um, reframing, should I say, of, of uh, arts and cultural institutions is underway. I think um, if that doesn't happen quick enough, there are other spaces. There are, there are the roads and the houses and the businesses that we reside in. Um, and we can intervene and show who we are through those. So um, for me, that's really where I'm at and where hopefully, <laughs> hopefully I can kind of, um, hopefully I can build on. So um, 
I hope that's of use. And um, yes, I just wanted to say thank you, really. Um, this is, I am presenting a lot of this work, but actually there is a, a team behind me, which I'm very, very grateful for. Um, and they, you know, as well as family and friends, but in particular that I have, I'm very lucky to have a, a very good network of people here in Birmingham who, who kind of believe in the work. And I'm really grateful for that. And as I said, really grateful to be able to, to show this stuff. <clears throat> so. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Vessel. There's a, so much in there um, and uh, so much that is of interest and speaks at so many levels. I just want to pick up a, a few things um, that you've been talking about and let me, uh, I've been sort of furiously making some notes while you were speaking uh, from the point of when you, point at which you spoke about graduating from Falmouth in Cornwall. And, and I'd like you to take us through that a little bit. So your home is Birmingham and, and you're in Cornwall. What, what does that mean in terms of um, race, the experience of race? Do you, I mean, and I, and I ask this out of uh, empathy as well, because I'm, um, uh, I'm, I'm married to a family in Devon, so it, it kind of, feels when you go to the countryside and you experience England in the countryside, it's a very different place. Um, and I'm not saying the people in Devon are, are racist or anything like that, but it's just a different world. It is not a city It's like London or Birmingham. It's what, so it would be interesting to hear your experiences. And I know you're at a university that in itself is a, is a kind of different type of microcosm, but did you feel that there was, um, that you were still growing up in that environment that you were in, or was there a huge shift in terms of who you were? There was definitely a huge shift. You have to be able to, um, you know, to an extent, there's a certain amount of camouflage that one has to use um, when essentially you have yourself in the sea and uh, really a very small, um, community of people. Um, so my, <laughs> you know, I, I was, <laughs> this is late 90s, this is rave culture, this is free parties, this is, uh, you know, I was, <laughs> it was a very peculiar, well, an interesting, but a, a very peculiar, you know, a very free place to be. Um, I was singing in pubs, I was doing cover versions in pubs with a guitarist at one point. <laughs> there was, you know, I was DJing at uh, sound clashes, we'd have, you know, there was sound, you'd have to make your own entertainment. So there was a, there was a, a way of being able to um, really be quite free in a way without too many, um, I suppose, um, really legal <laughs> kind of uh, restrictions but in terms of who I am and what what it was like being the southernmost the southernmost South Asian it was really difficult um, mentally it was traumatic at times um, and I was very very lucky to have one or two individuals that really were able to um, keep me keep me going um, in hindsight, I'm glad that I had the courage to do it, but, you know, would I have gone to SOAS or the London School of Art or something like that? Maybe, I think, I know Cornwall is changing. I know that that institution found particularly is somewhere I want to revisit. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was like moving back in time. So there were parallels between the stuff that I read to do with black history and the experience that I'd come out of as anyone would come out of, being of colour and living within the countryside. I'm sure there are people that are a lot better versed than me who've lived in Devon all their lives as a black person. Um, and I think you just have to find coping mechanisms. Art is a brilliant way of being able to do it. And luckily, um, I came through it just about in the end. Uh, I, wish, I wish I'd worked harder, honestly. <laughs> Okay. Thanks. Thanks for being very um, open about that, Faisal, I think. Uh, and you've um, communicated that very nicely in terms of how the landscape is so inspiring in and where you are. And 
and the people and it's also about the city life and provincial life isn't it those kind of changes to the pace of life to a way a way of life and and the food and i know food is a big part of your um journey of your artistic journey as much as it is a part of your um economic journey as well if i under if i've understood it correctly yeah. so could you uh, tell us then about um you mentioned identity right and when you were talking about identity and you talked about business and this is where i'm kind of why i thought of the food connection and your art connection and you talked about how to talk pe to people on a level and you know what it made me think of it made me think of right now when the government says all the time leveling up right or covid you know leveling up leveling down what does what does that mean what does that even mean do you see a kind of false consciousness around um leveling up did you feel i mean do you think that has some kind of resonance in the work that you do or do you feel that that was um when you when you're talking to people on a level what does that can you sort of yeah. elaborate a little bit no absolutely so um i grew up selling leather jackets with my grandfather uh, with my father and my grandfather um uh, i wasn't there every week dad if you're listening i know i wasn't there every week mm -hmm. uh but there is a part of um I think a lot of South Asian lives, which means getting involved with the survive, the day-to-day -day survivors, whether that's in a corner shop, in a, in a business or whatever, you need to be able to um, speak to people, not just sell to people, but speak to people, engage with people. And I grew up watching how my grandfather and my father would engage with people. That was my introduction to how do these guys really deal with society? Because I go to school, I understand that. But how do we deal with things on the street? Yeah, how do we deal with gaining a certain amount of trust? And the thing about markets and the thing about um, uh, the shop front, I think is where really the subaltern or the migrant introduces himself to the population. And I feel that there is a, a certain amount of um, play involved in that. There's a certain amount of trust and leveling, if you want to call it leveling, you know, it's it's the aspect of how do you gain a person's trust to know or to feel an affinity with you, empathy with you. You know, this these these kinds of triggers or these kinds of hu human interactions are really what what or how I was brought up. You know, I was brought up in that way of you know of dealing with people in in this kind of open and generous way, and um, that's why a lot of the work references, how do you display yourself on the street? You know, a lot of the signs in a way are, are statements that I'm kind of still saying while on the shop floor, it feels mm -hmm. like, you know, see it, say it racist or going back to where you hate from is a response to a, a racist customer in my shop. But the key thing I think is that this, this, uh, this conversation is taking place. And even if it may not be taking place in the way that it should, art in the third place, this third place that art is, and academia actually is, is I think is a great way of, of, um, of readjusting that level uh, of responding or talking truth to power, of, uh, of, of being able to uh, alleviate grievances, ridiculing racism, it's all there, you know? I know. I, I think that's really um, important uh, because what you're, what I think you're talking about there is also about the structures of racism that exist in society, or in terms of when uh, when it is when leveling up is talked about, and it's it's talked about social economic contexts and it's talked about a certain exposure of uh, BME communities in the pandemic and then there is this sense that there is an evening out because of the pandemic well structures that are embedded in society as you're pointing out show that that's that's a bit of a perhaps easy assumption to make and it's not really how things work or how things have people have experienced them as, as you've been narrating them and talking about them so i think 
that sort of comes out quite strongly in, in your work. So another thing I wanted to pick up about uh, your work with regards to growing up in Birmingham and, and sort of locating quite a lot a lot of your work in Birmingham. And you talk about the Asian uh, context of um, Pangra um, is Birmingham. And I think there's also someone, um, Sef Osmani has put a comment in, could you talk about the hipster racism or hipster exceptionalism that people are, our people are experiencing in Birmingham and in the London East End? Um, is it the same across the UK where these artists quarters are being used to push a gentrification agenda? So there's, you know, that kind of, um, context as well. But I'm also thinking about, you know, how does the Asian, um, is the Asian context the only context that is central to growing up in Birmingham? Or are there other identities and colours that one come, you know, that kind of notion of blackness as well as whiteness? How do you mix with those both in your practice and both in your experiences of, of, that, of being there? I mean, you go looking for it in a way, or that's just a part of growing up in Birmingham. There are, um, I'm really proud of my city in that way because we have a history of steel poles, um, from everything from steel poles through to Duran Duran, through to even more contemporary kind of aspects uh, now with the streets and other 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 kind, of, especially the grime scene as well, which which you know has a second home here in Birmingham. Um, so how do you negotiate those things? I mean. People talk about code switching quite a lot. People talk about the fact that you are multilingual in your city if you associate and if you explore your city properly. Um, and I think this whole aspect of what is multicultural, what is multi, multi, multicultural really, I know the term is very loaded, but being able to um, immerse yourselves in these sub worlds within the city is phenomenal. So no, the Asian, in fact, if anything, you know, I'm not gonna break down my percentages. That's for other individuals to uh, kind of estimate. I'm not really in that business, but um, for instance, one of one of my very dear friends is, is a, you know, um, uh, one would say a legend of the graffiti world in, in, in Birmingham. Uh, a gentleman called, you know, kind of Juice126. So he's, you know, he's someone who educates me in terms of that. Uh, but then I also have a friend who is um, a research psychologist who is constantly, you know, from, from an English background, from Kingsley, who, who, would, who will tell me about, um, I suppose, the different triggers to do with advertising and marketing. Then I have another friend who's actually Syrian, who is, you know, so... These, these, um, these, these kinds of multicultural demarcations in, in Birmingham are, are very apparent. I'm very grateful for them, but I don't, I mean, they're different for everyone, you know, they're different to whoever. It's just that I've been lucky enough in a way to pursue black history or the history of hip hop because I've been interested in hip hop. So that's led me to these kinds of different connections. But then I've also had a real, hip understand uh, wanted to know a real understanding of where is my position within black politics and struggle the radical tradition which has led me to asian youth movements and being introduced to individuals who have been involved politically in those things um so i've been very lucky in the way that there is a very rich texture and history to birmingham that hasn't been lauded but luckily my uh, i suppose my exposure to different areas has allowed me to do that. So my, my parents actually owned a shop on Soho Road in Hansworth, in the Hansworth area in the late nineties as well. But then I've also worked in an office in Spark Hill, which is Stratford Road, which is the south part of Birmingham, predominantly Muslim, north part is predominantly more Sikh. Um, I've also worked in Newtown, which is predominantly a black, you know, kind of an African Caribbean kind of area. So it's all out there if you want to engage. It's all out there if you want that to become a part of your future and, and, and so on. And I think that's something that Birmingham is, is really, really good at. Um, and it's not diluted down to this kind of diversity washed identity either. It's still raw. It's still very much, um, you know, historically based. And I'm really grateful for that, making up part of, part of who, my, who I am.
So oh, I'm sorry, does that answer the question? I hope that answers kind of the question around identity, but it's always a bit of a always a bit yeah. of a pretty no, no, I think that's uh, that's very, um, you've given us a very important mapping of um, the way you map the city or the way you walk the city to understand how you engage with it. And I think you, you have to remember that we're, some of us are experiencing it through the news media, like Birmingham is, is the place where uh, sort of, you know, the Trojan horse happens or things like that um, in, in, in how... Um, uh, you get the stabbings and you get you get the kind of negative stories don't you which is the stereotype which is gets reiterated again and again and how do we move beyond that and and your work i think is very important in helping us to think through that um and i uh, i mean there's lots more that i want to ask but i'm conscious that there are people also waiting with questions and putting them in the chat box so please can i remind people to keep putting their question at the wonderful audience who's patiently listening to us having this conversation to keep putting your questions in i'm going to come to them in a minute and and there's like you know i i wish we had uh, more time and i can talk to you a little bit more about the trojan horse um uh scandal and and your art practice around that, the play that emerged from it, the engagement that you offered. And I think some uh, somebody put in the chat box at some point about the riskiness of the work that you then undertake when you undertake a critique of Prevent. Did you, I mean, was that something that you felt because of the identity of who you are and what your context is, does that make it complicated or does that make it more urgent? I think it makes it la the latter. It makes it much more urgent. I think, um, you know, <laughs> I don't think there's anything, you know, it, it's, it, I have no, I don't really know how to answer that because, you know, prevent, prevent strategy is proving itself to be ineffective in a number of different ways. So <laughs> it's doing my work for me. I'm just highlighting certain instances of it. So I don't fear and I don't, I'm not fearful of, of anything or anyone for that matter. But my, I suppose what I was trying to say in my, in my um, <clears throat> presentation and what I'm quickly learning is that there are academics that are working in this sphere and I have to respect that. And I have to really read a lot more um, to do with the the the, the kind of um, the ineffectiveness and what is going on with prevent and also what is going on with how it works um, um, it, out in out in the public sphere with organisations. So I do want to be measured in responses. A lot of these are just you know a lot of the works are just responses to racism mm -hmm. as a person of colour. That, that that's it. You know they are they are those things. Um, but if, if really I wanted to go into detracting and dismantling what prevent, if we want to talk about surveillance, if you want to talk about its inadequacies and so on, then there are, there are forums like Prevent Watch, for instance, um, uh, and, and other organizations that are actually set up to be able to question those things. And I would, I would say that I would hope that maybe the works could be an inroad to finding out from much more learned people than myself around, around uh, such complexities, but I think one has to have courage, especially now. Mm -hmm. And this isn't courageous. This is, you know, for me, this could be seen as courageous. But there are people in Pakistan right now who are who are talking about, you know, who are being a lot more courageous than I am. There are individuals in in uh, in different parts of the world who are being a lot more courageous. So I think one also has to put these things in in, in uh, perspective as well. Mm -hmm, mm hmm. Sure, sure. I think that's um, yeah. I mean, I've um, I've not sort of stuck research prevent specifically, but it was a something that came up again and again in a research project that I was involved in on the question of Muslims trust and cultural dialogue. And in a sense, it, it sort of is the elephant in the room, whether you um, talk about it or you don't talk about it. And it it, it affects young people in in ways that are very very um difficult 
in, in negotiating identity, in negotiating a relationship to Britain as a place, as a home, as, as a community, you know, living within the community, it changes relationships with parents, it changes all those sorts of um, things with, with regards to belonging um, and, and feeling at home. So I think um, critiques are very important because they do re hopefully reach out and, and go out to, to the um to the sort of people writing up these policies and um saying that perhaps you know we need to rethink this this isn't well, really working i just wanted to i just wanted to interrupt say so actually the lucky thing is is that i've actually managed to see a lot of very um let's say colorful writing academic writing around prevent yeah and like my responses are really just very initial i see myself in the text Mm -hmm. uh, not just, I know you mentioned young people, but I also see myself in the text as I read it. And when you, when you read quotes like, you know, that the official prevent training emphasizes, it might be nothing, but it could be something within its training manual. When it says things like, um, you know, when it, when it mentions things like pre-crime risk, these kinds of terminologies are seen as the you know seen as you know kind of nor normal and i just find it astounding that that critique is not you know it is being provided but it's not being seen in a way so hopefully this work can 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 help with that yeah absolutely so i think um so then uh, just before i open it up one last question was a question that um was related to the later work that you shared with us of your forthcoming collaborations as well as your work. And it um, it's something that a lot of my students have been extremely interested in. And I think your work also I was quite struck with, I'm quite struck with, there's a, there's a lot of emphasis on masculinity and, and men within it and the relationship amongst men, fathers and sons and the youth, uh, youth sort of uh, history of Asian youth culture that you're referring to also had that um, picture of a young man. And um, I was interested in that um, point that you made about intergenerational conversations, because that is a point that comes up quite a lot with my Asian students about intergenerational, wanting to work intergenerational converse, uh, sort of, you know, ethnographies or, or that is something that they desperately really want to do. So I, I just um, thought I'd share that with you. I mean, it's it's not particularly a question, but maybe... No, 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 it's, it's very interesting. Well, the thing is that I think, you know, coming from a very patriarchal background, mm -hmm. forefathers and foremothers should have happened. Foremothers, unfortunately, couldn't happen, but it's something that we want to do in the future. So I'm very sorry about that, actually, because it, coming from a very patriarchal-based uh, kind of system, it was really an emotive reaction um, and it's the fact that really fathers South Asian fa and fathers generally don't have this kind of oh, what's the word truthful emotional conversations about the mistakes that they've made mm -hmm. or the or the successes that they've had because everything around us is to do with humility humbleness a, a kind of sense of pride you know we've come here off our own volition we'll work we'll do what we've got to do uh, and for me, there was so much more there that had to be excavated because we lose them and we can't be with them. And we need these lessons, especially to live within within uh, Britain, I think. And yeah. um, so that's really where where the uh, mm. that's what the, the project really was kind of underpinned by. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and I like that sort of play on the blue plaque uh, that you've got with your signage that's going on with, with the figures. Um, anyway, I'm going to, what I'm going to do now, Faisal, is I'm going to start reading out some questions from the chat box. Uh-oh, okay. If that's all right. And no, no, I don't no. know if you want to grab a pen and paper. Yeah. Would you like me to sort of read out a bunch of them and then you put out some responses? Uh... Yes, or we could do one by one. Well, whatever. Okay. Yes, let's do. You prefer one by one? Let's go. Well, there are a few. There are a few here. Okay, so we'll, I, I'm going to go from, from the one that's come in last. 
um, from Rona French, who's an immigration, uh, Birmingham based immigration solicitor, thanking you for the work and uh, wondering whether you had any projects, work of, or future projects engaging with the impact of the home office intrusion on individuals' lives here or home office surveillance, for example, people needing to expose themselves to a high level of scrutiny anytime they apply for status. Um, so that's a question. I can um, um, do you want to answer that. Straight I don't have any projects around uh, or future projects, but I can share that um, one of the, one of my dear friends, again, uh, who who is a great resource, who works within uh, providing free uh, law advice for um, new migrants, um, is engaged with um, uh, a number of different homes, and through videos that he's shown me of when he's uh, felt, um, I suppose, under threat or when people that have been working with migrants have felt under threat by um, uh, contractors, should we say, home office contractors. Um, I've often had to go through recordings of what contractors have said, and some of them are, you know, make quite interesting uh, listening. Um, that is something potentially I'd like to work on in the future. That's like the front line of, of how the civil liberties for for migrants are being affected from from someone who's working directly with them. So hopefully that's something that uh, I can look at soon. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. So I'm going to pick up a question from Asma Hussein, who is a student at SOAS, um, and she says, um, "Thanks you for your work and experiences." In terms of the question is, in terms of maintaining creative integrity. Have you had to navigate any demands, whether veiled or explicit, of watering down the message of your work to appeal to funders and cultural institutions that have historically only included Black, Asian and ethnically diverse artists when they are considered as having cross-audience uh, cross appeal? That's a great question. Um, so, no. I haven't had to. Um, I think the strength in the work is the fact that hopefully it doesn't do that. Um, I am very aware that diversity washing of dynamic or what could, maybe not dynamic, I shouldn't have said that, but of this kind of work um, is something that is apparent. I don't think I'm going to be sponsored by Rolex anytime soon nor that I want to be, but I think- Anyone from Rolex, please sponsor him. Please sponsor me with uh, But um, I was going to say the, yeah, I think it's a great question because I think the co-option of, um, we've seen this co-option happen again and again, especially within the arts. Saris, samosas, steel bands, let's, you know, there is this kind of thing that is rolled out constantly. And that's, that seems to be a really good, you know, a really good way of getting good funding. Like it's, it, it is the tried and tested method of, and I think there's a space for certain work like that maybe for certain audiences, but um, no, not me. I've not received any, any problems so far. If anything, um, people have been really supportive. And if anything, um, yeah, no, nothing of real, I'm just thinking. Uh, no, nothing, nothing has come about yet of any real significance that um, that stops me from, you know, kind of getting on with what I need to get on with. OK, thanks. Um, some appreciation from Ash for bringing back some memories of art and popular culture of 80s Birmingham. Thank you, Ash. Um, Darren says, great, thank you. Um, and Javeria says, thanks for sharing and uh, can relate to it. There's a question from Nadine Zubair. Fessel, um, do your exhibitions have a place in rural England? How do you think they would be receive, received? And she says she's enjoying the conversation. Oh, brilliant, thank you. Um, yes, there is definitely a space for them. Um, one of the projects that I haven't shown was in Margate uh, last year. Uh, and Margate in, and Thanet in particular is special because of a special kind of Nigel Farage who uh, came to prominence around there. UKIP came to prominence there and it also became like the front line 
fight uh, almost of, um, of, of taking our country back. And I actually went and put up signs to do with immigration and to do with uh, migration and to do with these kinds of subject matters on, on that, on a road called North Down Road, um, which also has a masjid, it has a mosque, it has a variety of uh, different um, kind of arts-based spaces, really great people down there, some amazing artists now also moving down there. Uh, and yes, it was received really, really well, but it does need to be out in the sticks. Um, but obviously Cornwall is in my crosshairs, if you pardon the pun, uh, at the moment. Okay. Um... Great, thanks. Uh, there's a Irini says very Irini Gunu. I don't know if I'm pronouncing the name right. Very interesting presentation. Big thank you from Athens and Greece. Oh, wow. Question from Monica Clark. Your exhibition of the pistols. What does that mean to you? As there are many. Right. So the Muslimic ray guns um, are a sculptural, uh, essentially reenactment of uh, a meme that was created via an EDL march. And I think that was probably 2010, 2011, uh, uh, quite an inebriated marcher uh, was uh, um, kind of interviewed about why he was there. And in his slurring speech, kind of was able to utter the words Muslimic Reagan. Um, and then the internet exploded around this, this poor, well, he's not a poor guy, he's a racist guy. Um, and the Muslimic ray gun was uh, the moniker used to essentially um, make him look pretty foolish. So I created sculptural versions of them. They were the first ones, uh, the first work that was created um, to do with how can I ridicule racism uh, and how can I manifest it? So I created uh, it as, as a meme, um, a sculptural meme. Okay. Um... There is, uh, I, I know we're at seven o'clock, so we're going, if Faisal, you're okay, we'll continue with the questions and audience members, if you, some of you want to leave because you have things to do, please feel free to do so. Those who have time, we'll, we'll continue to take as many of your questions as we can and have Faisal respond to them. So um, thank you for, for being so interactive and for sending all of this stuff in it. This is great. Uh, Colin, there is, Palmer sends a question. Very good talk. Wonder if you could talk more about why art like yours is so important in this climate. It's rare we see dissenting voices now. So in these times, do you think art becomes a bit of a life raft for people? And also, if I can add, you know, at a time when art is facing a massive funding crisis due to COVID. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And um, thank you, Colin. Uh, Colin is my actual friend, friend of mine. Um, thank you for this, Colin. Um, yes, I mean, art is not only is it a raft and not only is it a survival uh, a mechanism, but it's a, like I mentioned before, a third space where the kinds of contradictions that are being engaged with can be worked out visually, can be worked out in a way that have uh, human resonance and a resonance that hopefully everyone can begin to understand and engage with. Um, and that's why, yes, it is it is a survival. And I think you see that now within lockdown. Um, people are beginning to understand the value of the third space psychologically uh, and the value of being able to express oneself um, and, to, and to feel alive. Um, we've seen that with Grayson Perry and his art show now with Anthony Gormley and his window uh, kind of uh, show where people can really be free when they can't be free uh, physically. Um, and then in the context of really um, what you've said, Arno, in terms of the funding crisis and in terms of what's happening, I think as a nation, we're beginning to understand what, why art, the arts exist. And I hope that um, with everything that's occurred, we will see why, um, you know, cavemen were painting on, you know, on the walls, that we, we will begin to understand why arts is so relevant and so important to provide a reflection of who we are, what we are, and what we want to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think art can help us, hopefully, to break down the silos that we seem to 
love to to kind of stay with due to the ways that the structures of education or funding work in in terms of disciplines and categories and um science you know we've got the coronavirus pandemic right now we're going to have a mental health pandemic after this aren't we so um art and science are going to have to work very closely together to to kind of bring about a renewal of of people as we move forward um there's an appreciation from a message from celeste thanking you for the event and shouting out that she's a black artist living in brick lane studying performance and culture she loves your work now the next two are questions i'm going to put together if that's all right with you uh, there's a question from humera shoeb and she wants you to explain the red flag in the exhibit and i'm so glad she's asked this question what does it signify and who the words we know what you are doing are aimed at and i'm connecting this with a question from hamja asan to all uh, saying hasn't the meaning of asian changed with rise of modi hindutva and bjp and because the red flag is also connected to asia so i thought i'd i'd stick the two together if that's all right no, that's fine. Um, so yes, it, the the work is an additional work, and it's um, it's a response to the genocide occurring within China, from what I understand, of Uyghur Muslims. Um, we know what you were doing is has been described as lazy, actually, as well by individuals, but I don't think it is. I think it's a, an immediate response to one of the most surveyed countries on earth. They know what everyone is doing uh, within their country all the time. I think it's only second to maybe the UK or maybe the UK is after them. So um, it's a direct um, it's, it, it, it's a direct kind of piece of work that deals with the fact that no one is talking. Well, they are of late recently, but no one has been talking about the, uh, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, um, in China. Um, so that is what that work really was relevant to and about. And I'm also interested in being able to now begin to use different mouths. And I'm quite interested now in flags due to the rise of nationalism. And um, there are a couple of other flags that um, will be making appearance, will be making an appearance in, in hopefully future work, uh, seeing as flags seem to be so important to people. Um, and then secondly, in terms of um, Hamza's, Hamza's question about what Asian means, um, and especially in the context of Modi, uh, I think this is probably linked a little bit to China as well, that the obvious um, the obvious kinds of moves being made or the genocides that are occurring within places like India and China and Myanmar that we have seen where no one has responded to them mean that there is a, I suppose, a need to reclaim the terminology uh, of what an Asian of what an Asian person is, but then also understand the fact that the other terminologies or the my identification of what I am as an Asian, if I use the tradition of the Asian youth movement in comparison to what an Asian person is with relevance to specifically to South Asia, maybe slightly different. I think it reminds me of actually an artist in, in Pakistan who, who told me that, you know, work, you guys, you guys are always working about identity crisis and this and that and so on, which I find like quite offensive actually. I find it quite an affront. Uh, is we're called one name here when we're here and then we're called one name when we go back but the point is is that for me and for my politics anyway the term asian uh now that it's now that i am from the 80s not derived as a black person but i am now a person of color um but i'm also asian uh but maybe i'm also bane but maybe i'm also a number of other things i find that these terminologies are quite elastic and can be had fun with as long as um, I suppose there is a differentiation. So I don't know really what I'm trying to say there. I don't think I've really got an answer in the context of Modi. I don't really understand the, the question fully. Um, is it that Hamza is saying that uh, the term Asian has been taken over by Modi? Is that what he's alluding to maybe or? I'm not sure. Hamza, feel, uh, if you're still there, you can put your um, response in the chat. 
I think um, I think there's an interesting question to ask about Islamophobia as well in Modi's um, India and and the context of um, Dalits and you know it becomes very sort of a, a much larger question and perhaps not a question that you're necessarily um, thinking of right now in your exhibition but something that you might wish to come back on. Um, there's a there's a question from Saif Osmani, or there's a comment. Um, I don't know if you want to respond to this or not. Uh, I saw your exhibition at the Rich Mix that's been accused of social exclusion. Oh. Love the exhibition, by the way, uncomfortable context. Uh, you can respond or we can move on to the next question. Um, <clears throat> uh, I don't know. I don't really think I have a response for that. Hopefully it wasn't socially uh, exclusive, but um, there are other exhibitions, I guess. Okay, so there's a question from uh, Halp at Shani. Uh, I'm not, I don't think their name is there. Islamophobia is only one aspect of racism. Unfortunately, racism is a much greater problem than what was presented. When I first came to London, I was referred to as bloody foreigner and I am not Muslim. Okay, so that's a comment, I guess, it, uh, right. if you want to. Um, uh, okay, so the. I think we, we've sort of looked at most of the questions there. And uh, there's a question from Suman. Please, can you talk about your transforming narratives experience of going to meet other artists in Pakistan? We haven't talked much about your Pakistani uh, oh. context. So this is your opportunity. Thank you. For, thank you for the question, Suman. Um, mm -hmm. So I was really lucky to go to Pakistan uh, early last year. This was just as <clears throat> there were the kind of intonations of the of the pandemic and it was um, a research trip um, with the British Council um, and to meet with other artists uh, and other companies but I'd, I'd gone uh, really in, in my capacity as an artist partly but more in the capacity of uh, um, True Form Projects which is the organization that works a bit more with heritage but I was very very lucky to meet with um, and see the side of a city and cities that I'd only ever known when I was very young. So I lived in Karachi for the first three, two, three years of my life. Um, and I remember very fondly, really a variety of different things from riding on the back of a motorbike through to, uh, uh, through to eating kulfi at, at Hawke's Bay. Um, so uh, Pakistan, but it was a very, very different experience going to Pakistan in the context of going there with the British Council. It was um, obviously because of because of certain rules and regulations. It was a very different um, experience, but I'm very happy to say that um, the kind of work that is being produced now in Pakistan is amazing, especially contemporary work, especially uh, things like the Lahore Biennale, the Karachi Biennale, um, especially things that are coming out of Beacon House University, uh, Vassal Arts based in Karachi, um, and numerous other kind of curators and especially artists that are, uh, that are now um, becoming a lot more visible. So I'm really excited by um, the possibility of working. Uh, and also just to mention Rashid Arain, actually. Uh, Rashid Arain actually studied at the, I think it was the National Engineering School in Karachi. So there is another link to the British godfather of black art, the black arts movement to Karachi as well. So these are these kinds of links are really beautiful to be able to now find, to be able to track my journey almost in parallel in the same way as forefathers did. So um, yeah, it was amazing. I can't wait to get back to Pakistan. I can't mm -hmm. wait. My uncle's there actually at the moment. He's very lucky. Wonderful to, to hear that, Faisal, and we hope that uh, you will get an opportunity to to have those kind of, as part of your decolonizing journey, I think it, it's such a rich um, heritage as well as a complicated route to negotiate in terms of um, sharing knowledge and how you connect with other artists and how ownership and all those questions come up, don't they, in, in, in sort of those exchanges between, uh, as you said, going from here as an official representative and then being from there as a kind of person through family connections and through context. So, so lots of really important um, 
um, sort of threads to to all of that. And I hope that your journeys will get us and, and other artists like yourselves more and more bring those artists into our spaces as much as your art into their spaces. It would be wonderful to, I think, see that kind of reverse exchange as, as much as possible. Um, there's a question from Kafir Mohammed uh, saying, with your Suspect Objects project being in inspired by the gentrification of Brick Lane, what is your view of the Save Brick Lane movement? And are you involved in the movement? And she thanks you for your work. Oh, thank you very much. I'm sorry to say I'm not aware of the movement. Um, the So just to clarify, really, it was because I mentioned Brick Lane because I went down to do a project on gentrification and then it changed to Islamophobia on the basis of your histories that I collected. So that that's how it kind of changed. The, the, um, the aspect of gentrification had just occurred, around, I think it was just around the time that the serial cafe had had its windows put through, if anyone remembers that, on Brick Lane. Um, they had arrived and uh, that, that had occurred and um, I, I shifted tack at that point because of really the fact that other people had more um, or just different, I suppose, pressures. So, um, but I, I'm interested to know a little bit more about what that movement is. Um, especially now as London undergoes um, th th this kind of peculiar change. Uh, we're seeing it here in Birmingham to an extent as well. Um, and um, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, so I think this is um, a conversation that we will be uh, poss possibly going on for a very long time. So I'm conscious of time and, and uh, also, um, there are lots of people expressing their uh, appreciation and comments in, in the chat box. So what I think we could do, Faisal, is now maybe take the last couple of questions and, and then call things to a halt, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, there's a um, question or a comment from Mahanda Pal uh, saying, I was interested in what you were saying about racism as a material that can be used in different ways. Could you say more on racism in cities, towns, as sometimes I feel they are seen as safer spaces, but I've experienced lots of racism growing up in London. Well, firstly, I'm sorry to hear that, uh, that's, that's obviously a very bad thing to hear. I think, um, you know, <laughs> From my understanding, racism still occurs in cities. The racism that occurs in the suburbs or in rural kind of uh, uh, places is, you know, is the same race. It's, it's exactly the same race. It's just the context may be slightly uh, changed. The environment may be slightly changed. Um, in terms of uh, really what more to say on it, it is, I'm very sorry to say something that often can occur um, you know, kind of in very strange, weird and wonderful ways now. We're beginning to understand that the structures that we are a part of also uh, racism inhabits those. Uh, racism is not something that jumps out at you and tries to mug you or spits on you necessarily. It's not just that. It's something that has so many weird and wonderful forms. And I think we need to understand um, and have a good working knowledge from all of our different backgrounds on how you deal with those things. So, uh, for instance, the detox museums movement that is currently gathering pace about how we can engage with museums and art galleries, um, but then also how uh, racism plays out within maybe the prevent duty within uh, universities. Then also you have, um, you know, kind of, the, the, there are places that an active individuals and organizations that um, are working to combat it and I would you know I would say to you that there are plenty of people that you can reach out to and maybe get uh, information from and and also online there'll be plenty of toolkits and um, well there are now beginning to be plenty of places for people to go to be able to respond to uh, racism um, and obviously also the authorities um, but I'm really sorry to hear uh, of racism growing up especially in London Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, sadly, I can um, empathise with that and, and sort of say 
that um, things in London are not fantastic. Um, it's um, perhaps it's a city where one also comes to recognize uh, the self and other context um, in many ways, uh, in difficult ways. Um, there are, um, first of all, I just want to point out that lots of people have put their contact details in the chat box. So hopefully, Lucy, I think we'll be saving this. I'm pretty sure because we're recording this that so the chat will be saved. So there's an opportunity for uh, you to connect with people and for me. Um, and so the, the, and I think one of the things I also wanted to raise is when we're talking about race and Islamophobia, and it's, we're talking about obviously places where, um, uh, this is happening in a context where you're not the in the majority or it's part of minority politics and minority identification. And, and there's also the inverse um, Islamophobia that is present within Muslim nations themselves. And I suppose the context here is um, are also places like Pakistan, you know, what happens uh, within those those situations. And it'd be really interesting to see some kind of comparative um, perhaps work that might emerge from you at uh, from your kind of perspective at a later point so just uh, there was one um last question um about uh, prevent from joel lehman uh, from listening and uh, viewing your work are we to understand that you offer an answer to prevent from your complex criticisms do you believe in need for community intelligence gathering or do you resent the concept in its entirety? And I really like the, the focus on community there. Community intelligence. Thank you, John. Uh, the community intelligence is already gathering. The community intelligence is actually there. There is there are plenty of um, there are plenty of, I suppose, um, not just academics, but individuals that are looking to um answer you know like like i'm gonna said kind of ask and critique these kinds of processes in the way that if they are set out to um vilify us to vilify communities that they will be challenged so prevent watch is a key example of that uh, and there are many other key examples of people working within law uh, and academics working within law. John Homewood, again, is another example of how those verbatim, those, those kinds of transcripts of almost 200 individuals are now being composed. So there is, there is this, um, there is a response to these things. Um, and I, it's not about resenting any kind of concept, um, but what it is, uh, it, it, it is not, is not something that I think helps uh, any, 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 any community or even the country itself. Uh, and I know that for a fact that is similar across the rest of Europe as well in, in different countries. It doesn't help to uh, 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 vilify and, uh, uh, and uh, corner um, communities, I don't think. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Vessel. Um, so just to wrap up, are they um, and, and some final words from you that you might want to say? I mean, there's there's a prompt from some from from Carla Payne that might help you. Uh, are there any particular artists, whether they be visual, musical or theatrical, that you would like to collaborate with or see yourself aligning with in the future? Wow. Or just your thoughts? <laughs> oh, wow. No, I mean, there's some I mean, Hamza Hassan, uh, who I think asked the question, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of his work. Um, Obviously, there are people much more in the popular kind of field, but there are there are, there are people like um, you know there, there are people who are making interventions within within a British life all the time. So as well as people like Banksy, you've got people like led by donkeys. You've got um, um, who else? Who else could I think of off the top of my head? I mean, there are there are a variety of people like Loki, people like Sohaima Sohaima Manzul um, Khan, who is I think phenomenal talent, who is um, someone I'm also a big fan of, um, and actually, it's in in terms of my academic field. It's actually the women. Women are the people who are really, I think, I'm I'm in awe of. They're also the people on the front line against, uh, or who are being attacked within within kind of Islamophobia. It's not the big, it's not the big Turkish lad in the in the kebab restaurant. It's the it's our, it's it's women. Um, but I am um, I'm a particular fan of. 
there are so many. I'll actually have to put a list together, but in terms of writers and so on, I, I will need to compile a, a, list of, a list of inspirations. It's really nice to be able to see people like Gaz Khan, Riz Ahmed, um, you know, Asim Chal, the, these people, you know, any form of representation of, um, of who we are within the mainstream, I, I congratulate wholly and I wish, I wish them more power, more, more inspiration. Um, so I'm sorry I can't really answer. There's so many, my mind's gone blank. Yeah, sorry. Right. I, I think that's a good point where we can um, pull things to an end and it remains for me to thank the audience who've been absolutely phenomenal with their questions. We have loved your interaction. Thank you so much for being, you know, completely participatory and making this online and virtual experience such a rich and meaningful one. Um, it's, it's been uh, really a wonderful, wonderful way to connect. And thank you, huge thank you to Fessel for making the time, thank being you. available, for, for answering everything and for all the kind of admin leading up to it and for um, choosing to bring your work to SOAS. SOAS is enriched by your work and we hope that we will also have opportunities to collaborate with you and to work with you and to um, bring, you know, future conversations like this to, to the fore, as it were. And um, thank you for taking us through your archive. Um, <laughs> and thank you very much to, to John and Lucy as well, um, especially Lucy, who's, who's kind of put in masses of effort into Absolutely. the various admin parts of this thing and is sort of responding about the recordings and various things. Um, I, and and I think she will be reaching out to you with with a with the recording at some point. So um, I, I just want to add just one thing: if people would um, people could give some feedback about the exhibition, that'd be really that'd be really yeah. great. Bit of a plug. Fantastic! I think Lucy uh, circulated the feedback um, link at the start. I'd really so, appreciate that. That'd be great. Uh, yes. Uh, that would be great, everyone, if you can feed back to Vessel. He's really looking forward to that. So thank you, everyone, and wishing you all a very good night, a pleasant evening and rest of the week. And we hope to see you at another SOAS event in the future. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye.